Hey, welcome to Ringo Church Online. We are so excited to have you here with us today. We are currently in a series called Living on the Edge. All of us experience anxiety and depression to some degree. God has some very specific and helpful things to say to us about these issues. The hope for this study is that you will be encouraged. We want you to know that you have a Heavenly Father who looks at you and you are more than enough. He smiles and is pleased with you. During this study, our hope and goal is that you would walk out of this series with some greater hope and resolution to say, I want to get on a path towards healing. Let's dive into worship and the message this morning. Hey guys, we just want to uh, invite you into a time of worship right now. We're seeking God's presence together. Uh, so it doesn't matter what season you're going through, it doesn't matter what we're facing in life, we can seek God's presence knowing that He is always with us. He's never going to leave us and He's never going to forsake us. So it doesn't matter where you are, we just want to welcome you to worship with us. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, you are way made of miracle Keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are way made the miracle work of promise. Keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, healing every night, I worship you, I worship you, you are here.
is who you are. Yeah. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. All right, leave this part right here. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. trust you. We trust that you are in control. You're on your throne. And when things seem terrible, when things seem broken, you mend the brokenness and you make all things new. God, would you speak into our lives today? God, would you light a fire within us? God, we praise you and we worship you. We say this in Jesus' holy name. But church, we're gonna we're gonna focus on God's presence and His love and everything that He's doing in our lives, and we we want to continue worshiping and just giving God our all right now. Worship the One that chases after you constantly in every aspect of your life.
God, we worship you and we praise you and we run to you. God, may our worship be pure. May when you see us, when we walk into your presence, you not only see a heart of pure worship, but you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. God, would you help build us to be the church you called us to be, the people you called us to be. God, we give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' holy name. Welcome. We're so glad to have you with us today. We want to say welcome home. Today and next week, we're going to pause before Easter and do a short two-part series of messages on a very heavy but yet very relevant subject of depression and anxiety and some of the things that it creates, some of the things that we deal with that comes from this, the stress, the anxiety, the worry, the depression, the discouragement. We are living today in a prevailing culture of fear that the world wants us to kind of embrace. So fear is coming at us from all different kinds of angles. Now, many of you knew that we're going to be talking about this today, living on the edge. Our social media, our phones, our TVs, everyone is on edge. You're expecting to hear some truth that will help you with some of the answers to deal with this. You know, maybe you're ready for it. Maybe you're not ready for it. Maybe you're excited to hear this. I hope and pray today that you'll hear what God wants to say to you um, through His Word and through this message. Maybe some of you who are listening today, uh, because somebody invited you to come and to, to be a part of this series with us, this service today, uh, maybe you're more of a people pleaser kind of person. You told them yes, when really you just didn't really want to do that. You might miss something, you know, breaking news on TV today, but here you are, you're with us. Can I just reassure you today? Here's what I want you to know. 
Uh, this is what we're striving to accomplish today. One, I want you to be encouraged. Two, I want you to know that God's Word has something to say to all of us. So I want you to know what God's Word has to say about where we are and what God is doing. It turns out that our good, good Father is far from silent on this whole issue of living on the edge. He has a lot to say to us. And thirdly, I want you to feel some hope. I want you to experience hope. I want you to hold on to that hope in what maybe feels like hopelessness today. I also want you to know that I'm not a, doc I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not even a very good counselor. And that's probably truer than I would like to admit. So I'm none of those things. What I want you to know today is this, that I'm a human being just like you. And I'm your pastor. And I care about you. And the other side of this is I want you to know that I've been through some of this. I've experienced some of what we're going to be talking about today and next week. People around me, the, the ones who really know me the best, who are close to me, uh, they've seen me go through this. They've seen me experience this. I know what this can be like to go through this. I've seen other folks who are close to me experience this. I just want you to know today that you're not alone. We live in a culture that panders fear. We live in a culture that creates fear. It creates anxiety. And we are very familiar with this word. But do we really understand the effects that fear and anxiety, even depression, discouragement has on our lives? So let me just kind of give you a definition or description of what I mean today by anxiety. Anxiety is simply this, a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. Does that sound familiar today? Now, under that definition, this is all of us at times. Maybe you today. We all fit underneath this definition, this spectrum, somewhere, some way, somehow. If we were to ask some questions today, why? Why do we do this? I think one of the contributing factors would be we live in a high-pressured, fast-paced world. That's where we're living now. And some of our anxiety now is it's kind of drastically been slowed down. We've been forced into that. And we're like, how do we operate in this setting? A psychologist by the name of Robert Lee says it this way in, in his book called Anxiety Free. Here's what he says. The average American teenager today exhibits the same level of anxiety the average psych psychiatric patient did in the 1950s. He says we live in an age of anxiety. We have become a nation of nervous wrecks. I think we look at some of the reasons around us. Why are we a nervous wreck? And one of them is just stress. The Harvard Business Review says 60 to 90 percent of medical visits can be traced to stress-related issues in our lives. A guy by the name of Stephen Lillardi says this about lifestyles in his book, The Depression Cure. He says, we were never designed for this sedentary, indoor, social, socially isolated, fast food laden, sleep deprived, frenzied pace of modern life. Stress today is such a common thing. Stress is something we're all going to experience at some point, sometime in our lives, even maybe right now. There is no getting out of stress. What can happen in stress is stress turns into stressful days. Our mind is beginning to get exhausted, and because of stress, we become broken down to this place where we begin to, to feel the pain of anxiety welling up within us. And if we live with that painful anxiety and it's unchecked for any length of time. You do this long enough, you'll find yourself in the pit of discouragement and maybe even the pit of depression. And you're not sure quite how, to, how do I get out of this pit? So let me define today for us what depression is. Depression is simply this, a mood disorder characterized by the inability to experience pleasure, extreme sadness, poor concentration, sleep problems, loss of appetite, and feelings of guilt. 
helplessness and hopelessness. All those things play into our depression at times. And this is so rampant throughout our culture, our society today. If I just read that, you know, in this description, I can see myself at times in that setting, in that meaning of depression. I bet you can see yourself in that description, if not all of it, probably part of it. And what I want you to know again today is you are not alone. The spectrum of anxiety and depression, all of us find ourselves someplace within this, somewhere. All of us know what it feels like to be a little bit anxious, you know, especially in the morning, you know, when traffic is bad and you're really kind of pushing for time and that anxiety wells up within you where you get at that stoplight and you know you hit it at the wrong time and it's going to throw your time off and it really pushes you. You know, maybe you're going to miss that meeting. Anxiety just wells up into us. Some of us know what it's like to feel anxious. And sometimes we feel anxious and we don't know why we're anxious. We just woke up and we just feel it or we just feel the blues. And for others of us, maybe we've been diagnosed with something and, and it's much more serious than what we thought it was. And all this anxiety is wound up within us of the what ifs that play into the scenario. Or maybe we have a mental illness or disorder and we're experiencing depression due to some maybe past trauma in our life or abuse in our past. And that anxiety has a way of just really exposing itself. When I say trauma or abuse, I'm not necessarily talking about the physical kind. I'm talking about the emotional abuse, trauma. And many times that emotional trauma or abuse is just as damaging, if not more, than physical. You know, as a young child in your formative years, you know, you haven't fully developed the skills to evaluate and dismiss maybe spoke, you know, misspoken words or even untrue painful words that were said to you. And you just received all of that as a sponge and it just kind of gets imprinted on your soul and you develop these kind of neural pathways that whatever it is that triggers that takes you right back to those painful words, those traumatic words. And this is how you think and you see yourself based on that imprint within your, your soul and these words or maybe the lack of words from others in your life. Maybe there was a time that you confided in a pastor or a Sunday school teacher, or a youth group leader. And they looked at you, and they're like, looking at you like you're crazy, like you've lost your mind, because they don't know how to process what you just told them. Or maybe they're just very uncomfortable with what you just said. And, and, and maybe they tried to explain it back to you with little responses like, well, you just, you just need to be more faithful. You know, you just need to be in the Word of God more. You just need to pray more. You need to have a stronger faith. Or maybe worse, they, they kicked you when you were down and said, well, is there anything that you've done to cause this? Is there any unconfessed sin in your life? You know, maybe this is why you're feeling this anxiety and all this worry and stress in your life. Maybe you've got this unconfessed sin and God's trying to get your attention or God is punishing you or, you know, God has put you in this place. None of those words, none of that is helpful. So let me tell you, you're not going to hear any of that from me this week. You're not going to hear this from me next week. What the stigma has done that's in your mind, it's reinforced, you know, in your mind, all these things that were said to you. And basically what, what that imprint is in your life is there's something wrong with me. And you're trying to process this. Listen. It is not a sin to be sick. Did you understand that? It is not a sin to be sick. We got to put an end to that stigma in the name of Jesus. You would never think less of somebody who had some kind of physical ailment like the flu, you know, someone who had a pulled muscle or a, a torn rotator cuff or a broken leg. You know, you would go, hey, it's obvious you were hurting. It's obvious that you're sick. You know, there's nothing wrong with you. You're just physically ill right now. You need some attention. The pain of a depleted mind is just as real as the pain of a broken leg. 
And so many times we think it's painful to get help or medical treatment, but it's not. It's meant to be helpful. I think many times we find ourselves in this place where others say to us, you know, because of the mental side, the emotional side of the sickness many times is people look at you, you just need to suck it up, sunshine. You just need to snap out of this. You just need to be positive. You just need to be thinking good thoughts, and that will make all this go away. It's kind of like, well, no, I can't. I've tried all those things. Or you're like, God, please take this away from me. I don't want to go through this. And you prayed, and it doesn't feel like God is taking it away. Can I just say that more than likely God won't take it away from you, but God will heal you from it. Healing is the word. And here's what I want you to to know about today, this powerful word called healing. God wants to heal you, and healing is a process. It's a pathway. Depression isn't so much a pit. You know, many times we look at depression like a pit. But really, depression is more like a tunnel. Tunnels and pits are both very dark. Tunnels have a way out. God will meet you in that place and help you to heal to help you get out of it. He provides a pathway. It's, like, it's just like if you have a broken leg. You don't say, God, just please take it away. I mean, you want that. You want that instant healing. You know, if you have a broken leg or a broken arm, you're like, God, heal me from this. How's that healing going to happen? By going to the hospital, by getting the bone reset. It's painful to, to receive the healing process, the pathway. You know, they have to put a cast on it. And you have to be in that cast for a certain amount of time. There's some things that you can't do. It's uncomfortable. It's inconvenient. It doesn't happen overnight. It's it's a healing process. Mental illness, even the depletion of our minds, works in the same way. God will meet you where you are, and God will heal you by walking you out of it. It's a process. It's a pathway. And he is a light unto our pathway. So let's look today at God's word, what God's word actually has to say about this. How do, what does this process look like? And one of the things that might surprise you in this is when you look in Scripture, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, a lot of the heroes of the faith that we look up to in the Bible really struggle with anxiety and depression at times. And this is even true of heroes in history. Look at some of the heroes in history that we that we look up, look up to outside of the Word of God. Did you know that Winston Churchill, Abraham Lincoln, and the great preacher Charles Spurgeon all wrestled with anxiety and depression? There's a whole book in, in, in the Bible devoted to a guy by the name of Jeremiah. You know, and Jeremiah is airing out his feelings and anxiety and depression. It's actually called, this book is called in the Bible, Lamentations. The word means to lament. So we're going to look in Lamentations chapter 3 today. Lamentations chapter 3, beginning in verse 2. He has led me into darkness, shutting out all light. He has turned his hand against me again and again, all day long. He has made my skin and flesh grow old. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and surrounded me with anguish and distress. Now, look at what he's saying here. What is he saying in verse 2? Anxiety and depression feels like darkness. He says, I look around and I don't know where to go. What direction do I head? Now, notice he says here, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. Now, what he's saying here in verse 3, he says, this feels relentless. You know, when is this ever going to let up? How long is this going to last? He says, he's made my skin and flesh grow old. What is he saying there? Basically, what he's saying is, this is aging me. I, I, feel, I feel like I got all these miles put on my physical body, but not just my physical body, but also my emotional side of my life. And because of the emotions I'm feeling, it's even putting more like age. I'm aging like quickly here. So what does verse 5 mean? He says, in other words, I'm surrounded by these emotions and I don't know how to get free of them. He says, man, what do I do? So we go down to verse 17. 
Limitations chapter 3, verse 17. Peace has been stripped away, and I have forgotten what prosperity is. I cry out, my splendor is gone. Everything I have hoped for from the Lord is lost. Now notice here that Jeremiah is telling us what he's been saying to himself. My splendor is gone. Everything that I hope for from the Lord is lost. This is what psychologists call ruminating. Ruminating is is self-talk, negative self-talk. And what Jeremiah said there was real. What he was saying was real. These were real emotions that he was feeling, but it wasn't true. This wasn't truth. Ruminating is kind of like a cow that chews his cud. He eats the grass, chews it, regurgitates it, chews it again, swallows it, and he continues to do that, processing it. Many of us process a lot of negative thinking and negative self-talk. We kind of talk to ourselves, and it's real emotions, but it's not true. So what we're doing is we're sort of ruminating on some of these false narratives, toxic, toxic stories. I mean, have you ever done that? Do you do this? Do you ever get alone by yourself and you start thinking, why did, why did he say that? Why did she say that? What did they mean by that? What, what's going to happen if I get this virus? Will there be enough supplies? Will I be quarantined? Will I be able to go to the store? Will I be able to go back to work? What's going to happen with the, the economy? What's going to happen with my 401k? And we just start ruminating. Listen, all of those emotions are real. Okay, they're real because emotions are real, but it doesn't mean that it is truth. It doesn't mean those emotions are true to you. There is a documentary that's called The Bridge. It was done in 2004. There was a film crew who set up cameras on either side of the Golden Gate Bridge. Now, this is outside of San Francisco. Now, they set these cameras up on either side of the bridge for different reasons, different purposes. And what they got unintentionally is they caught several people committing suicide by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. Now, they created this documentary where they told the stories of different people who had jumped from the bridge. And obviously, many of them passed away, but not all of them did. There was one young man, a teenager, who jumped off the bridge, and he survived. And they were catching his story on this documentary. He talked about the fact that he was doing all this self-talk, negative self-talk. He was ruminating. I would call it a toxic story he was telling himself. He was in great pain. He was depressed. He woke up one morning. He faked being sick so his dad would let him stay home from school. When his dad left, he packed his things up and he bought a bus ticket. He jumped off the bus, he jumped on the bus, and he took it to a local Walgreens pharmacy where he purchased what he thought was his last meal. He bought a candy bar and a Mountain Dew. Typical teenager, isn't it? He gets back on the bus, he goes to the Golden Gate Bridge. He walks to the middle. It was a beautiful day. He stands there in all of this anguish and pain, all this negative self-talk. He feels so isolated and alone. He stood there trying to get the nerve to jump off the bridge. This tourist group from Asia walks up from behind him, taps him on the shoulder, and he's just totally oblivious to this group that is walking up, and they're oblivious to what he's going through. And they said to this young man, would you take our picture? They were on vacation, having a great time. It was like, This feeling for this young man was like being on a roller coaster. You know, why are all these people having such a great time when I'm in pain and they don't see it? He grabs the camera. He takes their picture. He hands it back. They smile. They're they're very appreciative. They thank him. And they turn and walk away. And right then he says, forget it, with language a whole lot stronger than that. And he jumps over the rail. He said as soon as he cleared the rail, he was hurtling towards the water. His mind totally cleared. Right then and there he realized, I don't want to die. As he's hurtling towards the water, he cried out to God. 
which he said shocked him because at that moment in time, he didn't even believe in God. And he said, God, if you're real, if you're there, God, please spare my life. And he hits the water. He survived. But a moment or two later, he came to and he said that sea lions were bumping his body towards the surface of the water. Now, let me just pause right there. Personally, I don't know what to do with that. I'm not going to be the preacher guy here today that says, God, God sends sea lions into your life. Did God send them? I'll be honest with you, I don't know. I don't know if God sent the sea lions. This is not even, to me, the amazing part about this story. The amazing thing about the story was as soon as he cleared the rail, his mind cleared. He was ruminating all of this self-destructive talk, toxic story he was repeating to himself. And as soon as he jumped the rail, he could think clearly. Now, this is simply my opinion. And, and you have the right to disagree with me, and that's okay. In the past, we have talked many times about how we have a very real enemy and this enemy is Satan, and he loves to deceive God's children. He loves to deceive and lie to all of us. And I think the enemy had deceived him. And as soon as he cleared the rail, the enemy said, Sweet, he is mine. Got him. But as soon as he jumped the rail and cleared the clouds, so to speak, he could think clearly. Now, if you are in that space, if you're there in that place today where you've been ruminating, listening to yourself way too much, and maybe even brought you to this place today where you might even be having some of this self-destructive, negative talk to yourself, can I just urge you today to think again? Yes, those emotions are real. Yes, those waves of anguish are battering the shores of your life. Just like the waves that you see at the ocean come crashing in, they always recede. Listen, you are not alone. Even though you may feel like it today, you're not alone. The Apostle Paul says this in his letter to the church at Corinth. We see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's look at verse 8. We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In other words, Paul is like, I want you to know, I want you to know that it might appear as if everything is all together. You might think that I've got it all together, but Paul says, I don't. We've actually went through a lot of hardship, a lot of trials and tribulations, trouble. Paul says, we were going through this pain and this anguish, and from the outside, outside appearances, it may have seemed like, wow, those guys got it all together. Can I just say to everyone today, can I tell you that nobody's life is as good as it appears on Instagram? When you're looking at an image on Instagram, it might be the 25th or 26th take. It has been carefully placed there. It has been carefully filtered. And you are comparing the low moments of your life in that moment with carefully crafted highlight reels. Now, I'm not saying that they're lying when they put that picture out. I'm just saying it is not as it always appears. Paul says, don't be mistaken. Don't allow this self-talk, this negative self-talk to take you to a place where you might do something permanently damaging. If I could just give you a definition today of suicide. Suicide is this. Suicide is a permanent 
irreversible attempt to solve a temporary problem. Is what you're feeling right now real? Absolutely. It's real. But suicide is not the answer. And if you're wrestling with this today, I would love to encourage you to call the Suicide Prevention Hotline number. Reach out, get some help today, and don't stay where you are. You see, these thoughts receded for Jeremiah. So let's not leave the story hanging here when we come back to Jeremiah. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 21. Jeremiah says, Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. I love that. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, The Lord is my inheritance, therefore I will hope in Him. The Lord is good to those who depend on Him, to those who search for Him. So it is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. You might find yourself today in a pit where you don't know exactly where to go. But God will meet you where you are in that pit. And God will begin to help bring you out of that pit one step at a time. He will not leave you hanging. We actually see another wonderful example of this from an individual in the Old Testament by the name of Elijah. And I want to quickly look at his story, just like we looked at Jeremiah's story, and how God meets Elijah in the place where he helps him to walk out of this depression, discouragement, anxiety, stress, worry. And there are some things, powerful things that we can learn from Elijah that applies to our lives today. And what you need to know, what you need to know about Elijah is that he's one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. He was not a weak guy by any stretch of the imagination. He was a strong dude. He had experienced incredible victory, an incredible victory in 1 Kings chapter 18. God showed up in a powerful way. Now, I don't have time to totally unpack that entire story for us today in 1 Kings chapter 18. Many of you know that. So if you would, go back today and read 1 Kings chapter 18. And it, I'm telling you, it is worth your time to see how God showed up in a powerful way in Elijah's life and through his life. In 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah gets, in, gets into it with the prophets of the false god Baal. They step into, we'll call it the octagon. And God just embarrasses the prophets of Baal. And God uses Elijah to do this. It's, it's powerful. It was an incredible moment, an incredible victory for God and for Elijah in that moment. Now we come to 1 Kings 19. Elijah wrestles now with fear and anxiety and even depression. You know, how do we go from one moment, from one chapter, one moment, one day to the next? How do we go from a mountaintop experience to the valley so quickly? Isn't that how it usually works? Do you want to know... For me personally, the moments when I'm most prone, when I'm most vulnerable to the feelings of anxiety and even depression, you want to know where Don Conley tends to ruminate? You where Don Conley tends to do the most negative self-talk? Ironically for me, it is always on Sunday evenings. It doesn't matter. We could have had 700 people in worship. It could have been a phenomenal day. We could have had 15, 20 baptisms. I could have talked to all kinds of people and heard all kinds of cool stories of people talking about how their lives are being impacted and changed. And I could have all these neat interactions in the morning and just so excited that we have a a wonderful, exciting, fun church. And then I go home on Sunday afternoon. I'm tired. I'm depleted. I get alone by myself. I turn on the football game, but I'm only half watching it. And all of a sudden, I start ruminating. Man, we had a great day today. But then I'll pick out a sentence. A sentence will come to mind of something that I said in the message. Maybe something that I added in that I I questioned in that moment, but I went ahead and added it in. And I go, why did I say that? Why did I say it in that way? Or why didn't I say this? Or maybe I'll have a conversation with somebody out in the lobby and that conversation gets just a little awkward. Or maybe 
that afternoon an email comes in and maybe it's just a little edgy, a little cruel, a little critical. And I'll just start, I'll be honest with you, I just start ruminating some of this stuff in my mind and in my heart. And usually on Sunday evenings when, you know, Dana will kind of, she'll leave me alone, just let me kind of have a quiet time on Sunday afternoons and she'll kind of check in on me and she'll kind of say, how you doing? And she'll come and she'll find me sitting alone and I'm sitting in my main cave where it's quiet and she'll walk in and go, how you doing, honey? And in my honest moments, I'll be like, oh, man, I'm, I'm really tired right now. Man, I've, I've been wrestling. I mean, I'm just down. And many times she can see it. She knows when that's happening. Let's just say it this way. The path out of the pit for me is well-worn. I've been known to fake it. You know, you ever heard that statement, fake it until you make it? I've been known to fake it at times every now and then. I could be hurting and you come up to me and I got the biggest smile on. You're thinking, man, nothing is ever going wrong in his life. Not always. Elijah experiences one of these great victories because of the Lord our God. Now look where we find him in Luke or in 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 3. Elijah was afraid. And I want to stop right there. The reason he was afraid was because Queen Jezebel threatened his life because of how God had used him. Now she puts a timetable on him. She's like, I'm going to kill that dude. I'm going to kill that Elijah in 24 hours or less. Now, if somebody puts out a death warrant for you, that one, that one ties and induce some fear and anxiety within you. I don't care who you are. Even if you are the powerful you know, prophet Elijah. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 3. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Now let me stop. Remember, self-talk. That's, that is the perfect picture of negative self-talk, ruminating. This is not true. His emotions are real. They're raw. But it's not true. Why is he saying this? He's ruminating. This is a toxic story that he's telling himself. Go on to verse 5. Then he laid down and slept under the broom tree. We don't have a lot of details as to how Elijah got to this particular place in his life. But however he got to this moment in time in his life, it caused a lot of stress and anxiety for him. And here are a few things from this story that might induce some of the anxiety and stress in our lives that maybe, maybe you're dealing with this today. If not, you've probably done this in the past. You might be doing it right now. And if not, be prepared. It will probably happen at some point in the future. You see, here are some of the things that we wrestle with, just like Elijah. The first one is this, the unknown. He didn't know what was going to happen to him tomorrow. He didn't know if he's still going to be alive. And the fear of the unknown can take you to some bad, bad places. The second thing, the unlikely. It's unlikely to happen, but you know what? I'm worried. I'm fuming over this. This is where negative self-talk kind of goes. It always goes to that negative place deep within our hearts. Number three, he deals with the uncontrollable. Elijah couldn't do anything about it. Many times life feels out of control. We don't like for life to feel out of control. Number four, the unnecessary comparisons. He's comparing himself. Now, notice what he said there in that passage. He's comparing himself to his ancestors. Listen, that would be all of us. We all find ourselves in this kind of moment where we might be susceptible through those things to kind of be saying the same thing. I just want to die. I'm no better off than all my family that's went on before me. Just, Lord, take me now. The next thing that we see with Elijah is this. He isolated himself. Not only did he feel isolated because of his role as the, the prophet of God, 
You know, many of you today, many of you who are leaders, you know that feeling of loneliness. Even when you got people around you, that intangible weight that you carry on your shoulders. Here, here Elijah is. He's a prophet of God. He feels the weight of this. So what does he do? He goes and he gets physically alone by himself. He went out in the wilderness. I mean, he just takes off out in the wilderness. Now, just like mold grows in the darkness, depression grows in isolation. Now, if you didn't get that, I want you to hear that. Just like mold grows in darkness, depression grows in isolation. Jesus himself wrestled with anxiety. I think he was wrestling with depression in the Garden of Gethsemane the night uh, before he was arrested. Why do you think he kept crying out to his disciples? Why do you think he's crying out to his friends who are there with him? Guys, my friends, why can't you stay awake with me? Jesus did not need their prayers. Jesus, Jesus could outpray them anytime, any day, any moment. Jesus needed in that moment their companionship. If Jesus needed that, so do you I, so do you and I. It says in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. This is one of the reasons why we gather together, and when we gather together, especially in, in the church, you can't just assume that that person that you meet in the hallway or that person that you meet at the door, or that person you meet in the lobby, you come across in a parking lot, you know, even though you may not know them, you can't just assume that everything is just hunky-dory because they came to church. They may have came here, you may have came here to that moment in time, you know, in church or wherever it is, and there's something that is heavily weighing you down. We can never dismiss that offer of a cheerful word or an expression, a wave, a high five, a handshake, a hug, a kind word goes the extra mile. You never know how God might use you in that moment. Use your words to cheer someone up who's really struggling, even though they have a smile on their face. And the last thing that I want you to see would be this idea that, that Elijah's going through is this. Number six, false narratives. Elijah was repeating these false narratives, this toxic story to himself over and over and over. We left him in the story under the broom tree where he kind of fell asleep. And look what happens. But as he was sleeping, an angel of the Lord came and said, get up and eat. And he got up and ate some more. But notice here, he got up and he looked around and there beside his head was some baked, you know, bread that was baked on some hot stones and there was a jar of water. So he ate and drank and he lay down again. And, and, and we see that the angel touched him and, and said, Elijah, you need to eat. And he ate because he was depleted and he fell asleep again. And we come to 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 6 through 7, and notice what it says here. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. It's so easy to miss that. But we see right here that God was not just tending to the emotional condition of Elijah, but God was also taking care of his physical condition. Part of the pathway out of these feelings he was feeling was he had physical needs that needed to be taken care of. Namely, he said, you need some sleep. You need to get some rest. You need some quiet time. You need some food. Now, he didn't say it here in this passage, but exercise would be the same sort of thing. Do you know that there's some studies that are saying right now that exercising four times a week for 20 minutes has the same effects as anti-depression medication? That's powerful. We got, to, we got to stop and examine some things here. 
And once again, I want to be very clear, I am not a doctor. I know all of this when it comes to emotions is very, very complex. So all I'm trying to do is make this as simple as I possibly can. When you find yourself in a pit of despair, you've got to ask yourself, what are the negative thoughts I'm dwelling on? And what are the chemicals that are being released because of these negative thoughts? Because there are. There are, there are these chemicals that are released within your body that can do good and can do bad. We, we have to stop and examine those things. What are the positive things that I need to do to begin thinking about, you know, because your body responds to positive thoughts. It puts chemicals into your brains that can heal you when there's a depletion. This is not self-help mumbo-jumbo. The Bible reassures us of this. The Bible says, as you think in your heart, so you become. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, fix your thoughts. Now, think about that. In other words, your thoughts don't naturally go there. He says you have to fix, focus your thoughts. You've got to be intentional about this. Fix your thoughts. Now, he goes on to say what is true. This is where God's Word comes into play. You read God's Word. You memorize God's Word, not because you're going to be tested on it later to find out whether you pass or fail, but because when your mind starts to spiral, when your mind starts to go down that path into negative thoughts, negative toxic stories, and you start ruminating, God's Word puts up a roadblock, puts up the stop sign. Whoa! I know that you're feeling this way, but God's Word reminds you this is not true. You need to turn around and go another way. Don't go this way. Paul goes on to say in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Now notice here, this is important. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Wow. Why do you do this? This is not, well... Pastor Don said, I got to think myself into a happy place. You know, this is not about thinking yourself into happier places. This isn't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. There is a chemical thing that happens within our bodies. And many of us know that there are things called neurotransmitters. We got these chemicals in our bodies that are associated with positive, helpful thoughts. You know, some of the chemicals within our bodies, dopamine, you know, when that's released in our body, you know, do something good, accomplish something. Serotonin, healthy foods, you know, oxytocin, human connection, endorphin, exercise. These chemicals are released within our bodies. Exercise, now listen, exercise is not about just getting skinny. Exercise is not just about pulling out the guns and building muscle. It's about mental health. We got these things, these chemicals that need to be released into our brain that helps us to replenish the depletion of our minds. But there are transmitters that actually can have negative effects, namely cortisol. Cortisol has its purpose, but cortisol is triggered by stress. And when you have this open-ended stress and it just keeps piling on and you're not doing anything to manage it, cortisol is just pumping in your body and flowing through your body. And what it does is it slowly is depleting your mind. If you don't have these other four positive things combating this cortisol, you find yourself over time getting in a place where your mind gets totally depleted and you begin to not trust. You can't trust what you're feeling anymore. So to begin the healing process, you've got to manage. Paul says, manage your thought life you got to manage some of these behaviors. So can I get just super, super practical as we kind of end this out today? If you are wrestling with this, get some help. Get help. But get different kinds of help. Not all help is equal. You need good friends in your life who will speak truth in your life. You need a good marriage. 
You need good relationships. You need good interaction with other people. You need the help of a counselor or a therapist or a pastor or all of the above. We need mentors in our life who are willing to speak truth in life, maybe when others will not. We need a group of people around us who encourage us and pray for us. We need different kinds of help in our lives. The issue is we have to get help, get different kinds of help. Surround yourself with help. Many of us, we are too embarrassed. Our pride gets in the way. We're too embarrassed to reach out and say, help me, please help me. Can I just say, don't wait. Don't wait till it's too late to get counseling. There's, there's this thing called preventative maintenance. And preventative maintenance is far better. You don't wait to change the oil in your car until your engine is blown up. You don't wait until you're in the middle of a crisis when things are blown apart before you go back and start trying to get help. Don't be too proud to get counseling to get help. Here's what I want to remind you today. It takes time. So give, give it time. Here's another thing. You don't have to let it go. You need to transfer it over. Now, some of you have watched Frozen too many times, and you're like, stop it. This whole let it go, let it go. But you don't, you don't hold on to this. You don't, you don't have to let it go. Just transfer it over. And I think this is where people need to really grab hold of. All of us need to grab a hold of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. So if you would, let's, let's just say this together. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now let's do that again. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now notice what it says there. It says cast. We get tripped up on this word cast. It's not actually a very good translation of the Greek word. When I think of cast, I think about fishing. You know, I got a fishing pole I'm going to cast out into the water. I got this problem in my life, and I just need to cast it out there. Do you see the logical problem with that? Because if I cast it out there, I can also reel it back in. And there it is again. It comes back. The Greek word for cast is this word. It's transfer. The Greek word for cast is transfer. Transfer all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. In other words, you don't just pray, you know, pray it away. It doesn't just go away. You transfer it over. And Jesus would say the same thing to us. He would say in Matthew chapter 11, Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Then Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Jesus says, let me, let me carry it with you. Let me come alongside of you. Let me walk with you through this. Let me carry you through this. The last thing I want to say is if you're in this place today and with everything that's going on in life, if you find yourself today feeling hopeless and maybe you're in the midst of hopelessness, if you would grab a hold of this, understand that this is a chapter and not the conclusion. Understand that this is a chapter of your life and not the conclusion. There was a season in my life where looking back, I'm pretty confident I was probably depressed. I'll just be honest, I was depressed. I was really struggling. And in the moment, I didn't know what to call it. I was way too proud to get help. I was way too proud to reach out to anyone. I was in a, a funk, and I was in that funk for a good while. And a lot of it was because I was working too hard. I was stressed out. I wasn't necessarily getting the results that I thought 
that I wanted. And largely, when I look at the bigger picture, largely it was my fault. The cortisol was just flowing in my body because of all this stress. And I remember getting to this place where I was anxious every single day. I was moody. I would wake up every morning, my eyes would pop open, and I would lie there, and I was not looking forward to the day. I didn't want to do it. I look back at that time period, and I can say to each and every one of you today that God brought me out of that pit, and God healed me from it. Now, there's the word. God healed me. It was not overnight. It wasn't like the next day I got up and went, whoop, great news, snapped out of it, done, fixed, all gone. It was a healing process. I want you to know today I'm still a work in process. And when I look back, I can't exactly put my finger on it, but I know that it flipped. And God began the process because I was leaning more into him and I was fixing my thoughts and I was focusing my eyes on Jesus. There was movement. There was healing. The process began. It would have been a mistake for me to say in that moment, I'm done. That's the conclusion. That's the end of my story. That's how it ends for Don Conley. Here's the other thing that I would say to you today. Never put a period where God puts a comma. Never put a period where God puts a comma. Too many of us simply make that mistake. And that's what makes the story of our lives so interesting. There's always a place in a movie or in a novel, the, the book that you read, where if you put the book down, or you push the pause button, and you're like, I, I don't know how they're going to get out of this. But if you were to shut off the movie, right there, that would be the conclusion. What makes the movie or the story good is the resolution, the process to the end. Some of you today are in that chapter. And God wants to move you through that chapter and he wants to move you beyond it maybe into the next chapter can I just say to you today as I look back on the season of my life and specifically that season of my life that I'm talking about today I've gotten to the place today that I'm grateful for it I can see how God was working and how God was moving how God was sustaining me and how God used that Use that moment in my life to teach me some very important things. God never wastes a hurt. God used those moments to deepen my faith and my trust in Him. God used those moments to shape me. God used those moments to humble me. God used those moments to give me greater empathy. Empathy that I needed for others. Listen. The cross of Jesus Christ, as we get ready for Easter here in the coming weeks, the cross of Jesus Christ at Calvary, it looked like a period. It looked like everything ended with a period at the cross. But the cross of Jesus was a comma. And if Jesus Christ can come back from that, you can come back from this. And you get to define what this is. And all we want to do is lovingly encourage you, come around you, and help you. Today, I just hope that you feel encouraged. I hope that you know today with all of your heart that you have a Heavenly Father, a good, good Father, who looks at you and He says, you are more than enough. You have a Heavenly Father who sees you and He smiles and He is pleased with you because He created you. 
And I, can, I hope that you can walk away from this message today with some hope that says, I want to get on a path towards healing. And I would encourage you, you were not meant to be a long ranger. Bring somebody along with you. Bring somebody into that journey with you to what God is doing in your life and through your life. There's where you'll find freedom. You see, broken lives matter to God. Broken lives are welcome here. And this is what we know to be true. And Paul says, fix your thoughts on what is true. What is true? Broken lives are only mended by Christ. Let's hold on to what is true. And truth is what sets us free. Let's pray together. Father God, we come to you today. We come to you right now in this moment, God. We thank you. Thank you for your love. God, we thank you for your grace that never leaves us in that pit of despair and depression and discouragement, but provides a way out of the tunnel. God, we thank you that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and God, we thank you that that light has a name and his name is Jesus. You are a light unto our path. God, we thank you for that today. So God, I pray that you would hear, that you would hear us in our moments of struggle and discouragement, and even depression, calling out to you, trusting you as our healer. And God, I pray that each and every one of us would hear from you through your Holy Spirit words of hope and words of healing, that it's not a sin to be sick. Life is a struggle, and none of us are immune from the anxiety and depressions that happens at times in our lives. So we have a great amount of empathy and compassion for anyone today who may be struggling with this, maybe in a more severe way than we are. God, we know that there is hope and that hope has a name and his name is Jesus. And God, we cling to Jesus today. We cling to Jesus today like never before. We know that Jesus lends to us today a helping hand. For those who are wrestling, he comes up beside us and he, he grabs a hold of us and says, let's walk through this together. Father, we thank you for that. Thank you for the promise that you never leave us nor do you forsake us, that you're with us always. God, I pray today that you would restore us. God, I pray that you would bring healing. God, I pray that you bring hope to each and every one of us. That the church, in such a time as this, that the church of Jesus Christ would lead the way because we know the way. We know the truth and the life and the hope, the truth of Jesus Christ. And Father, we ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ today. And all the church says together, amen. God bless you. Thanks again for joining us today. It's an honor that you would spend time with us. We would love to see you get more of God's wisdom in your life through the power of God's word. We invite you to participate with The Message Connect every week. The Message Connect dives deeper into the message from Sunday morning with questions, scripture, and challenges to go deeper in your faith walk. We have a lot to celebrate at Ringgold. The Lord is doing amazing things here. Your generosity at Ringgold directly impacts God's mission to go and change the world. Giving is an important step in spiritual growth and maturity. Put simply, growing people are generous people. If you haven't done so already, now would be a great time to set up online giving. If you call Ringgold home, we encourage you to give financially so we can continue to serve and make an impact in our different communities and our world. You can give online through the Ringgold Church app or at ringgoldchurch.com give. If you're not comfortable with giving online, that's okay. You can also visit ringgoldchurch.com give to view other possible ways to give. To stay connected with all things Ringgold Church, be sure to download the Ringgold Church app and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Well, thanks again for hanging out with us today. We'll catch you next time right here at Ringgold Church Online.